Hi, I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person. And I know that making a video isn't the same thing, isn't as good, but it was the, the best I could do. I hope you'll understand that it's my um, youngest daughter's 21st birthday today and plans changed after I'd made the arrangement about coming to speak at Queen Pastures. And um, if it was almost anything else, um, being with you would have been more important. I'm sure you'll understand. However, thanks to technology um, that I learned during lockdown, um, I hope this video will um, help you think and I really look forward to seeing you in person and uh, maybe talking about some of the thoughts that I have today. So in a minute, I'm going to read from uh, Luke chapter 10. It's a very well-known passage. You'll, you'll recognise it, but try to hear it like you've never heard it before. Before I read, I want to tell you something that happened um, well over 20 years ago when I was um, a young and fairly naive um, trainee Baptist minister in inner city Manchester. Um, I lived in... Um, the kind of borderline between two areas of Manchester that are well known, which are Rush Home and Moss Side. And when I walked to Bible College each day, I, I walked down something that looks actually quite a lot like Normanton Road, if that helps, just wider and, and busier. Um, there was a mixture of Indian takeaways, um, Asian shops, um, some, some housing, some burnt out buildings, some derelict, um, quite a few of them had squatters in them. Um, one of those houses, um, there were squatters in it, um, there, there was a fire and the result was that there was a guy that used to sleep um, outside it on, on, on a mattress on the pavement and I had to walk past him along with thousands of other people um, every day um, on my way to Bible College. And for some reason, he always picked me out. Um, loads and loads of other people just walked straight on by, but he picked me out and he asked me for money, and I tried to say that um, I didn't have any. Um, at the time, it was the poorest that I've ever been in my life. Um, and then he got angry. Um, not in a terribly threatening way, but he often used to um, point and shout <laughs> as, I, as I walked past not knowing what to do. One morning, um, I was down um, on the rotor to lead morning college prayers, which he did with one other student. And there was a Bible passage um, that was set um, for e each day. Um, and the theory was, if you went to every morning prayers for the four years you were there, you heard the whole of the Bible read there. Um, if I'm honest, I found morning prayers a bit dull and boring because they were a set format where you uh, the words that you said were already set. Um, you just inserted um, two Bible readings and that was it. Evening prayers were a blank sheet of paper. You could do what you like. Um, I loved leading evening prayers, but morning prayers I had a bit of an attitude towards. Anyway, that, that morning I um, overslept a bit. <laughs> And I looked at my watch and thought, oh, uh, I'm not even going to make it in for student breakfast if, uh, at this rate. Um, so I got dressed as quickly as possible, I walked down the, the road thinking, um, if I just go straight into chapel, it will be okay. Um, I know the Bible reading is from the gospel story, so it won't have a long word that will embarrass me when I try to pronounce it in front of other Bible college students and vicars and tutors and so on. So it will all be fine. Um, and as I was walking down the road, I could see Noel, his name was, um, getting up already and starting to point. And I thought, I'm not having this today. So I walked in the other direction for a little bit to the Pelican Crossing, crossed over to the other side of the road and walked down the other pavement. Um, and the noise of the, um, the crowd and of the cars drowned out Noel's Noel shouting, but I could see him pointing at me as I walked down the road raced into college um, uh, nobody noticed me um, coming in as, as they were having breakfast I went straight into the chapel um, just to see if I could catch my breath because I'd been running for the last bit to make sure I wasn't late um, and to be honest people thought that I was very um, spiritual and that I'd skip breakfast because I was fasting before leading morning prayers mm. couldn't be further from the truth we went through the bit of liturgy um, I got up, I opened the and the Bible at Luke chapter 10 and these are the words that I had to read in front of about 50 trainee ministers um, and their tutors and a few visiting priests. On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him the next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper look after him he said and when i return i will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. As I started to read, I just wanted a hole to open up in the middle of the chapel floor and to, and to jump in. It was awful and we had to finish off the liturgy. Rather than going to my next lecture, I went to go and see my personal tutor um, to say that um, I clearly wasn't the right kind of person to be um, a minister or church leader. Um, and to that morning would have proved it. Um, he said something really interesting. Um, he pointed out that um, I did pretty well at college. I was um, got my essays in in time. I, I worked hard on my church placements and my community placements. Um, I got on with the other students, always listened well and so on. And he said, and today, finally, for the first time, you learned something. So what are you going to do about it? He said he would tell me what to do, but he said, I think you already know. Go, go, go and do it. So I went down to the kitchen um, and I had no money. And I said, is there any chance that I could just make a cheese sandwich? Now my tutor had already phoned the kitchen and said, give him whatever he wants. So I made a cheese sandwich and I walked back up the Wormslow Road and I found Noel. I'm still sitting on his mattress. Um, I sat down and we shared the cheese sandwich we ate, we ate together and I, I talked to him uh, I listened to a bit of his story. I tried to explain where where I was coming from and what I was doing. And then I said, would you mind if I prayed with you? Um, and he was very happy with that. Noel never asked me for money again, um, but he did often stand up and point and he would shout, there goes my friend Graham, which was, to be honest, um, quite, quite embarrassing, but at the same time was a, a lovely gesture. Um, because people had given him money sometimes, usually throwing it in front of him without even looking in his face, but nobody of the thousands of people who walked by on the busy road daily seeing Noel there. Um, admittedly, you know, he was an alcoholic, um, wasn't always easy to, to talk to or to listen to, um, but nobody else had ever stopped and just talked. So I learnt something that day. Many years earlier, I'd um, been asked a, a question that I didn't understand um, by somebody about the parable, saying, who do you identify with as you read? Who are you most like? And I had confidently, confidently said that I was like um, the Good Samaritan. Uh, I wasn't like the priest or the Levite. And um, his answer was to prophesy over me something that happened on that day in Manchester so that one day you will realize quite how much like the priest and the Levite in the parable you are and as a result of it you will spend a lot of time with people who don't think 
am I the priest, the Levite, or the Good Samaritan, but rather will identify with the robbed man, people who think that they have no choice, no control over their lives. The, the priest and the Levite were full of fear of all the wrong things. Um, maybe it was fear that the robbers would attack them if they stopped. More likely it was the fear of being spiritually unclean before they got to Jericho and therefore not being able to do the religious um, ceremonies that they were meant to be leading because they would have to go through the long process of, of cleansing having looked at a possibly dead body. Fear of all the wrong kinds of things stops us from loving our neighbour very easily. The Good Samaritan, well, if you, if you don't know, um, Samaritans absolutely hated Jews um, and Jews absolutely hated Samaritans. It was that group of people for both of them that you had been brought up all of your life being told that they were wrong, they were beyond the pale, you shouldn't have a relationship with them. And society tells us that about many, many people and it's wrong. And that's why Jesus tells us um, a parable about a Samaritan and also um, has the most amazing conversation in John's Gospel with a Samaritan woman at, at a well, revealing spiritual truths that he hadn't revealed to his disciples and so on, um, because he sees the um, imposing society, meaning that you cannot be somebody's neighbour, as wrong and something that needs to be overcome. So what stops? somebody being a good neighbor what stops somebody loving their neighbor what stops you being like the Samaritan well the first one is the barriers that society places on us when we say one people group is all of those lot you know I don't know anybody's name I don't know who they are but I've already decided they are not my neighbor um, it might be to do with geography it might be to do with many, many other things. Um, for me, there have been a couple of things while I've been in Manchester. The first one, ironically, is um, being in Hartington Street. Uh, when I first moved to, to Derby with a, with a very young family, um, several people warned me not to go down Hartington Street to visit um, my friends there um, because the street was beyond the pale and it almost became a... Um, a thing that I had to argue with people at the corner who were thinking they were doing me a favour by saying, don't go down there. M more recently, as we've had a, um, a Roma gypsy congregation at uh, my church and these people have become my, my friends, um, I've been warned um, many times that, um, oh, these people, they're just there to rip you off or whatever it is. I'm thinking, but you haven't met them and they're my friends. Um, all of us have these people. Um, I grew up with the news of sectarianism between Catholics and Protestants that I could never understand who, how two groups of people who say they follow Jesus and would read this passage could hate each other and throw stones at each other in Northern Ireland and yes in Liverpool and Manchester and Glasgow and many other places. So you have to overcome society to be able to love your neighbour and do what Jesus asked. For the teacher of the law who asked the question if you notice, he can't bring himself to say it was the Samaritan who was a good neighbour, who loved his neighbour. Um, he has to say the man who had mercy on the other man. And Jesus won't let him off the hook when he says, go and do likewise. He says, go and behave like the group of people that you say that are beyond the pale, that you, that you hate, that society says is not, are not your neighbour. Go and be like the Samaritan is what Jesus says as a final passing gesture. So the first thing that stops us from loving our neighbour is um, accepting the barriers that our society places on us and saying that they are, are real and groups of people can never be our neighbour. The second one is not understanding the cost that there always is in making peace and bringing reconciliation. So um, for the Good Samaritan, the cost of peace between him and a Jewish man beaten on the side of the road was stopping to help a Jew, risking being attacked by the robbers who had attacked this man. Um, some oil, some wine, a donkey ride, and the cost of a stay at a hotel, and the medical bill until the man was well. 
that that was the price of m making reconciliation in this story that Jesus made up that could have happened in real life. For me and um, Noel, who slept in inner city Manchester, the price was a cheese sandwich and 20 minutes of my time. It was a small cost to pay for reconciliation. For us and God, the price is Jesus dying on a cross, crying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. <laughs> Remembering that the disciples mainly had, had fled. It was just a few women who had stayed with him who looked from afar. That the people who heard Jesus cry out these things were the chief priests um, of the, the Jews who had made sure that the crowd had shouted, crucify him. And the Roman soldiers that had literally banged the nails through his hands and his feet. That was the price, the cost of peace and reconciliation between us and God. Jesus' death and then his resurrection. And that all leads us to ask, well, who is my neighbour? <laughs> the question that was asked that the parable brings out. I, I have learnt that the answer is very simple, but then very hard, like many simple things in the Bible, to follow through and do. Because the answer to who is my neighbour is absolutely everyone that I meet in life. Absolutely everyone who crosses my path. All of them are my neighbour, and I'm called to love them all as a basic thing that if I'm a follower of Jesus, Jesus who loved those who nailed him to a cross and prayed that they would be forgiven with his dying breath. How can it be any other way? Everyone I ever meet in my life is my neighbour. If you see that as a hard and a challenging thing, then you will struggle with it <laughs> until the day that you meet your father in heaven and then discover that some of the people that you struggle with are worshipping with you face to face and that you should have reconciled with them. But if you trust God and his plan for your life, then there is a much more beautiful and better way of seeing it. That God has a plan for everybody who crosses your path. Sometimes a plan that will bring you closer to God. It's those people that were sent um, across your path to show you the way to, to Jesus in the way that only you needed. You'll meet people who will uplift you and encourage you and enable you in every way to fulfill God's call on your life. Who will be there for the great moments in your life and will be there to pick you up when you fall over and you're down and you've messed everything up. Those people are really valuable. Look out for them as they cross your path. Some of the people who cross your path will be those that are really challenging. Those people that you find difficult, annoying, who have the same character flaws that you have or the ones that you find most difficult in life. And that they are sent to test you, to learn to love your neighbour, to grow up, to become more mature in Christ. But if Jesus could pray for those who executed him then surely we can love those who annoy and irritate us and some people will even be sent to cross our path to truly test our faith to truly test whether we can love our enemies as Jesus told us to and sometimes those will be the people from whom you will learn the most even if it is the hardest lessons that we learn in life because I choose to believe that God has a plan for everybody who crosses my path in life. If only I will open my eyes and see it. And sometimes the man who screams at you for money as you walk down the road and you don't know what to do about it turns out to be the person who completely changes your view of what ministry and following Jesus is about and becomes the person who cries, there goes my neighbour, my best friend. Learn to love them. Ask God to give you the heart that will allow you to love your neighbour as you love yourself. 
and your neighbour is every single person who crosses your path in life. Amen. <laughs>